All right, I want to do a study here for the youth out there. And so if you're not in your teens, then just shut it off. You don't need to watch, right? <laughs> Wrong. Uh, there's still some challenges for us older people, you know. <laughs> there's still some good challenges for us too from the scriptures. And uh, certainly we all run into people that can, you know, use the scriptures. You know, might run into a teenager that, that is wondering about the issue of peer pressure. And you can write these scriptures down today and show them these scriptures from the King James Bible. So, let's go start out here in 2 Chronicles chapter 10. In a different location today. So, uh, there's going to be some road noise. I apologize for that. But as I stated in my other video, uh, my truck broke down here. And... Uh, so I'm kind of stuck here, and I just have to use what I can. But the Second Chronicles chapter 10, verse 1 through 19. Interesting story here we're going to read. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for to Shechem were all Israel come to meet, make him king. Rehoboam is the son of Solomon, King Solomon. So you have King David, King Solomon, Rehoboam. Verse 2, And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whither he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard it, that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. And they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Come again, or come, yeah, come again unto me after three days, and the people departed. And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. If you know the story of King Solomon, he had lots and lots of money. And the way you get lots and lots of money is to have lots and lots of people working for you. And you study about the thing of King Solomon building the temple and all this stuff. And he had hewers of wood and cutters of stone and all this stuff. You know, a lot of amazing things there. And, you know, he had great riches and great wealth. And the people are saying, okay, you know, all right, we built the kingdom now. You know, can we please just take some time off? Do we have to be working six days a week, you know, here or whatever? I mean, this is like a lot. Can we just, you know, ease the burden a little bit? We're okay. We have plenty of money. Let's just kind of ease off on the work. And the older men are looking at the thing and they're going, yeah. See, a king has to be careful what his subjects think of him. You don't just have dictatorial power as a king. You need to be concerned for your people out there. But let's look and see what Rehoboam did. Verse 8, But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him, and took counsel with the young men that were brought up with him that stood before him. Kind of like he succumbed to peer pressure, like the other young men, like, like he was. You know, like his classmates, his schoolmates, his buddies growing up and whatever else he took counsel from them not from the old men that's a mistake verse 9 and he said unto them what advice give ye that we may an return answer to this people which have spoken to me saying ease somewhat the yoke that thy father did put upon us and the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him saying thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee saying thy father made our yoke heavy but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. Now, if you want to be heavy-handed, a heavy-handed ruler, my little finger is going to be bigger and heavier than my dad's, you know, what's it say there? My father's loins. You know? In other words, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to be much worse than my father. Verse 11, For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people 
came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king bade, saying, Come again to me on the third day. And the king answered them roughly. And King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men and answered them after the, manner of, or after the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was of God that the Lord might perform his word. God had it in for him. Which he spake by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite, Shilonite, uh, to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And when all Israel saw that the king would not hearken unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? And we have not inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel, and now, David, see to thine own house. So all, so all Israel went to their tents. In other words, they just said, Ah, oh, fine, you want to do that to us? We're going to go out there in the wilderness. You can run your city yourself. Verse 17, But as for the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. That king Rehoboam sent, then king Rehoboam, Rehoboam sent Hadaram that was over the tribute, and the children of Israel stoned him with stones that he died. But king Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem, and Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. So, by his greedy little action, and you know, why did he do that? Well, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Why did Rehoboam want them to work harder? Because the money that his dad had wasn't enough. He wanted more money. He wanted more power. And so did his uh, youthful companions. The older men are saying, Whoa, 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 you know, we have enough money, we got plenty. Just back off here a little bit. You know, don't make the people too mad. And Rehoboam says, No, I want more money. I want more. And he pushed the people and he split the nation of Israel. Hmm. Interesting. Now let's look at uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered of the house of Judah and Benjamin an hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against Israel. He's like, hey, you're not going to work for me? You're not going to pay your taxes and things? I'm going to force you to. That's what he's thinking. That he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. Another good argument there, you know, is it ever right to obey the word of God and disobey the king or the president or politicians, the law? Oh yeah. If the word of God tells you to do one thing, and the law tells you to do something contrary to that word of God, then you obey the word of God. Just as simple as that. But interesting, very interesting. And why did Rehoboam get himself in all this trouble? Because he succumbed to peer pressure. You see, peer pressure is a group of your peers. That means people that are your age, people that can relate to you, people that are in your same predicament, your same situation. Now, older people, they were your age at one point in time, and they went through the same things that you went through. But now they can look back to that, and they can see the problems and the errors. And they can see, I remember making those mistakes. And so it's good to talk to those older people, because they can tell you about those same mistakes so that you don't have to make them. But you see, when you compare yourself with people that are your own age, well, some of them might give you some wisdom and experience that they've gained, but not like an older person. Not like going to the elderly and asking their opinions about things. You see, if you hang out with all your teenage friends and things like that, all it's going to do is lead you into the same mistakes that they themselves are making. And they will make some real big mistakes sometimes. How many teenagers, you know, I remember back when I was in high school, Quite a few years ago now, 
But uh, back when I was in high school, you know, there were teenagers that would go out and they would make a mistake. You say it was just a little mistake. Yeah, but the problem was the mistake was that they were drinking, uh, underage drinking, you know, and uh, they got behind the wheel of their car and their other buddies were also underage drinking and they got in the passenger seat in the back seat and that uh, little mistake ended up costing some of them their lives. There were kids in my high school that died because of alcohol-related accidents. Kids in my high school that were injured for life. I remember one young man was uh, riding a motorcycle and uh, actually went into a corner and somebody had mowed the, the yard and the grass, that slick wet grass was out across the pavement. He was wearing shorts. I don't know why you'd ride a motorcycle wearing shorts, but you know, especially street bike, that's really dumb. But he hit that grass and just went whoop right over and his skin from his ankle up to his waist was just ripped right off. Just a simple mistake. You say, well, well, what good would it have done for him to talk to an older person? An older person with some experience would have told him, hey, don't ride that motorcycle like that. Put some pants on, young man. Put some protective gear on. You know, if he'd have had uh, protective gear, you know, special riding pants or things like that, whether leather or some of the other ones with the padding and things, he'd have been fine. But wearing shorts, you hit that road going about 40, 50 miles an hour, they're going to be picking your skin up off the road. You know, they call it road rash. It's a shame he didn't listen to the older people. And, of course, you know, a lot of the other ones uh, I saw too. But uh, we're going to look at the word youth in the King James Bible. Turn back to Genesis chapter 8. What does the Lord think about youth? Young folk. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 through 22. It says here, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. It's the first time the word youth shows up in the Bible. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done, while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So there you see the first reference to youth and what is it, you know, what is that reference there? Is it a good reference or a bad reference? Um, bad reference. Uh, it says there, man's heart is evil from his youth. So when does your heart begin to really get evil? In your youth. We're going to see more on that as we continue. Turn next to Judges chapter 8. Now I'm going to show you the Bible is very negative about the thing of youth, but interestingly it's also very positive in the right context. If you're a young person, you don't feel like you're some kind of second rate, and you're not going to amount to anything else, and you're no good and whatever else, uh, you can be actually very good and very honorable in God's sight. But you have a lot to fight against because you haven't really experienced a whole lot. That's why the Bible warns about being a novice, going into ministry as a novice. But let's look here. Judges chapter 8, verse 18 through 21. It says here, Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother, as the Lord liveth. If he had saved them alive, I would not slay you. Now look at this, verse 20. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn, up, up, and slay them. For the, But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. Hmm. So he didn't, wasn't really battle-hardened or anything. I'm going to make another point on that here in a minute. Verse 21. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us. For as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camels' necks. Notice what they said there. For as the man is, so is his strength. So they look at this young man. They say, well, he's a man in terms of a male. But... Uh, as he is, he's just a boy, 
So he has the strength of a boy. Hmm. You know, uh, that's one of the prejudices that will be against you if you're a teenager, if you're a young person. Oh, you're just a boy. You're just a kid. You're going to have to go against that. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you're going to have to say, well, I might be a boy, but, you know, I know what the Bible says. And, you know, part of the reason that that young man there didn't want to draw his sword is probably because he didn't know how to use it. You know, as a Christian, you need to know how to use the sword of the Spirit. And that's why I recommend reading it so much and studying the Word of God, the King James Bible. Study it, read it, just memorize it, get it into your mind. You know, why? Well, because when combat time for fighting comes along, you're going to be ready to draw the sword. The Lord says, okay, I want you to spiritually slay that person over there. Out comes the sword of the Spirit. See? It's very important to remember that. 1 Samuel chapter 17. You see, that kind of paints a dismal picture for the youth, doesn't it? I guess all youth in the Bible are just cowardly, right? No. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. Okay, it says here, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to fight against, or to go against this Philistine, to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Hmm. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant, blew, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. What's your motivation when you get into a fight spiritually? Are you saying, hey, you attacked me personally. I don't like that. You, you hurt my pride. My ego has just, you know, suffered a blow here. I'm going to teach you a lesson by quoting scripture at you. Wrong motivation. If you're a youth and you hear somebody uncircumcised Philistine, you know, like Goliath, somebody's blasph blaspheming the word of God, they're mocking the Bible and things like that, draw the sword and say, hey, you defy the armies of the living God. You defy the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what the Bible says about you. And you quote scripture to that person. That's the right motivation. Not because they've attacked you personally. That's the wrong motivation. Jump down to verse 38. Okay, I guess not much of a jump, actually, next verse. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. Also neither, another neat little spiritual tie in there. You know, you should have a Bible that you're familiar with. You know? And this thing here is about falling apart. I'm, I've been taping it and doing all kinds of stuff. The pages are all wrinkled and, and everything else. And, you know, it's, it's got, uh, you know, finger marks and all kinds of things. You know, why? I've proved it. It's been with me for many years now in battle. I feel comfortable with this one. Now I can look up verses in other King James Bibles as well. But... Uh, how about some guy coming along and saying, Hey, Brian, I'd like you to talk about this subject. Here's your New King James Version. Since you forgot your Bible, you don't have your Bible with you. Here's New King James. Oh, I'm not going to go into battle with a sword like that. You know? I don't think so. Well, let's continue. Verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, 
and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou camest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the hosts, host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose, and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Gotta love that. Uh, pretty neat show of bravery there. You know, and, and faith that the Lord was going to deliver him into his hand. Verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag, and took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine, and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran, and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. That's another fun thing that you can do. You know, it's sort of like what I did with the 13 reasons why every Christian must reject the Mass. I took their sword, the Roman Catholic Jesuit Dewey Reams Bible, I took their sword and slew them with it. You know, that's why, it's, again, it's very important to understand the Bible version issue. So you can go along and some guy's telling you, you know, this false doctrines or whatever, and you can say, well, let me tell you about false doctrines. That Bible you have there, that NIV, let's look up some verses. You know, and you can take their own sword and turn it on them and slay them. Pretty neat. Now, is there another youth in Scripture who fought with a spiritual sword? Turn to Luke chapter 2. Jump over to the New Testament for a little bit here. Luke chapter 2. I think you can make a little more noise. Luke chapter 2 verse 46 is where we're going to go. It says here, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto to him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Hmm. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. If you are very young, if you are in your early teens, and you are still living under the roof of your mother and father, there are times that you're going to have to be subject to them, even if they're wrong. Why? You're still under their authority. But when you become a man, when you get older, as a young man, now you have the opportunity to leave, get out on your own, uh, if they're not believers or whatever, and uh, do things for the Lord, live for the Lord. But even in a situation where you are subject to parents that don't necessarily agree with you, you can still grow in wisdom and stature. You can still grow up. You know, you can still, I mean, I've, I wasted my life till I was 25 years of, of age. 25 years of my life I wasted on myself before I got saved and got serious about serving the Lord. You know, and even after I was 25, it was still another 10 years 
um, basically another 10 years before I, you know, really started to do anything ministry-wise for the Lord. And, you know, I was studying and things like that, but uh, I wasted a lot of years. If you're a teenager, you have the opportunity to have a lot more fruitful years than I did. Don't waste your life. Next, let's go back to Job chapter 13. Back to the Old Testament. It's funny too because you know you have Jesus there and he's asking these doctors questions and things like that. And you got to understand a lot of these uh, Bible preachers and professors and things out there, they really don't know the Bible very well. And I've seen young people, teenagers and, and whatnot that are Bible believing, have been really studying the Word of God. And I've seen them that they can actually blow the mind of these PhDs sometimes. And they're, they're marvel, and they're going, "How'd you hear all this stuff? Where'd you know all? Of it? How on earth did you know? Did you learn all these things?" <laughs> it's kind of funny. I've seen that a bunch of times. Young people that are more spiritual than older men. Job chapter thirteen, verse twenty-six it says, "Here, for thou writest bitter things against me, and makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth." Hmm, iniquities of his youth. I thought that was kind of interesting. Job chapter 20, verse 11. Job chapter 20, verse 11. His bones are full of the sin of his youth, which shall lie down with him in the dust. Uh, you can't really get rid of the sins of your youth unless you're lost and you get saved and you know then they're under the blood. But the point is, the sins of your youth are there and the best thing that you can do is just uh, serve the Lord as much as you can, very fervently, and uh, try to forget about some of the dumb things that you did in your past. That's what I try to do. Job chapter 30 we're not going to cover every reference today, by the way, to the word youth. Because uh, some of them just says about the wife of thy youth or whatever else. You know, so They're not all relating to you if you're a young person. Um, Job chapter 30, verse 12 and 13. It says here, Upon my right hand rise the youth, they push away my feet, and they raise up against me the ways of their destruction. They mar my path, they set forward my calamity, they have no helper. So... A lot of times a youth will foolishly mock older people that they see going through hard times, not understanding that they themselves might end up going through that same thing. You know, uh, kind of interesting there. Next we're going to go to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. Whoop. Psalm 25, verse 6 through 14. It says here, Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Okay. And again, like I said, if you've messed around with sin and you're a youth, stop. You know, confess it, forsake it, and move forward. And really start to serve the Lord. And God will reveal things to you when you begin to fear Him. And that's really the key to the whole thing. The way you, you know, uh, get away from sin and get away from iniquity is to fear God. Because you see, if you fear God, you're not going to fear your friends. You're not going to succumb to peer pressure. You get around your friends and they say, hey, uh, 
you guys want to see a movie I got? You say, what kind of movie? It's an adult film. You want to see it? Now, if you fear God, you'll say, I'm not watching that. No. Oh, come on, goody two-shoes. What are you afraid? Yeah, I am actually. I'm afraid of God. No. Oh, whatever. See ya. I'm leaving. You get around your friends and they're out there and they go, Hey, you want to try one? Try a cigarette? You look at that and you say, Well, that's going to hinder my walk with the Lord, so uh, no. I don't think the Lord would be pleased with me putting that into my body. No. Oh, what, are you holier than thou? Whatever. I fear God. I'm not going to do that. Hey, you want a drink? Hey, you want this? Hey, you want that? Whatever. No, I fear God. That's what you do. Next, go to Psalm 71. Psalm 71, verses 1 through 5. It says here, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me, and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort, that thou, thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, and out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. <coughs> Excuse me. That's very important. Your trust from your youth should not be your physical strength. It should not be your money. It shouldn't be your family connections. It shouldn't be your education that you're getting. That shouldn't be your trust. Your trust from your youth should be the Lord and should be His Word. That's where your trust should lie. Let's jump down to verse 17 there in the same psalm. Psalm 71, verse 17. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. Hmm. So again, if you're an older person, right there that verse hits you. Because when you are old and gray-headed, you're supposed to tell people, the younger people, the youth, about uh, all the things that the Lord's done for you. And how many times the Lord's gotten you out of sin and blessed you and things like that when you didn't deserve it. <coughs> Excuse me. That's very important. And the best testimony that you could have is if you're a youth and you get saved early on, and you get away from sin early on and you say, you know what, I'm not going to mess with that stuff. And I'm going to serve the Lord and I'm going to show people, I'm going to give God the glory for what He does in my life. And I'm going to tell younger people about that in the future. Good advice. Don't succumb to peer pressure, in other words. Next, go to Proverbs chapter 2. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 2, starting in verse 10. It says here, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, remember the beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to, the, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, <clears throat> which forsaketh the guide of her youth. Interesting there because, you know, the Bible talks about the, the law of God is written in people's hearts. So you can have a adulterous woman like the Catholics, and they start out understanding the Ten Commandments because it's written in their heart, and later on they forsake it. Verse 17, And forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. 
that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Again, very interesting. And again, seeing there, if you are a youth, you know, the Bible talks a lot about living a good life here on this earth. And I do mean God's blessing. I don't mean being a multimillionaire or something like that. I'm not talking about that. But getting God's blessing, earning God's favor, and it comes by you departing from evil, by you staying away from things uh, of the world that will mess you up. Get saved and then get sanctified. See? Very important. Next, we're going to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou, in other words, enjoy life, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. In other words, your joy and your, your fun and everything else that you're doing there, that's great, do it. But remember that God's going to judge you for whatever you do. Verse 10, Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. I can say a big amen to that. I mean, I'm not that old. I'm not, you know, 2015 I'll be, I'll be 40 years old. But um, I'm not that old yet. But uh, it just seems like forever, you know, a long time ago, that I was in high school. And yet when I was in high school, I thought it was taking forever to get out of high school. And I thought, man, am I ever gonna get older, you know? And, and uh, you know, I remember when I hit 18, I was like, wow, you know, this is great, I'm an adult now. You know, I'm no longer a minor, a minor. but uh, then you hit 21 and you think, well, I'm even older and all this other stuff. And now I look back at that and I think, how silly how many dumb things I did back then and things I wish I could take back. And you can't. But uh, you say, did you enjoy life? Yeah, I did a lot of things that were enjoyable. Um, am I, have I been judged for some of the things that I did in my youth? Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately, I got saved. So in the sense there, I'm not going to get judged for those things that I did in my past. God's not going to send me to hell. But... Uh, I have had to pay some wages of sin that I did in my past. I wish I would have heard good preaching back when I was a youth. I wish I would have turned from a lot of the evil things that I was doing. You have an opportunity to do that today if you're a youth and you're watching this. You say, well, what are my friends going to think? Huh? 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 See the peer pressure? You know, if your friends are going to give you a really rough time about living a sanctified life for the Lord and fearing God, maybe you need to get some new friends. Maybe you should hang out with uh, older people, much older. I'm not talking about, you know, you're 15 and you should hang out with an 18-year-old. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who's in their late 20s, early 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s even. Might be a thought. Look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. I remember seeing that with my grandfather. Uh, he was the one, that, the, the last relative of mine that, that passed away. He was 98 years old. And uh, he had no pleasure in life anymore. It was just like, he'd say, you know, we called him Pop Pop. We'd say, Pop Pop, what do you want for your birthday? I don't know. I have everything I need. I, I don't want anything. What do you want for Christmas, Pop Pop? Hey, you looking forward to Christmas? I guess. <laughs> you know, 
I mean, you've been you've been alive that long, and you're saved and stuff, and your body's aching, and you realize you're never going to get better. You know, you're you're just time's almost up. You start to really want to go to heaven. You know, after a while. But you don't have to worry about that in your youth. You can enjoy your life. You can do fun things and stuff like that, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you come out of a place like this, and you hike, and you go fishing, or whatever you want to do. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But just remember, you're going to be judged for it, for whatever you're doing. You know, spend your time serving the Lord. Let's continue. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 27. Lamentations chapter 3. It comes after the book of Jeremiah, if you're not familiar with where that's at. And i got to try and keep that in mind. Occasionally I've been told, you know, that there are new believers that watch and they're like, you know, I don't know where some of these books are. You know, kind of slow it down. Of course, you can always pause the video, which is kind of nice. Definite advantage of the technology that we have today. But uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 27 says here, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. That's a pretty good verse right there. Definite New Testament tie-in too. You say, how so? Turn to Matthew chapter 11. If you know your Bible, you probably are figuring out where I'm going here. Just keep it down. I don't want you spoiling the surprise for the other people, you know. So... Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I'll get there sometime. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all the ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Very interesting. Back there in Lamentations, it's saying the youth, uh, a wise youth essentially, is going to take that yoke upon them when they're young. In their youth, in other words, there. Very interesting. Because if you are wise, you will get saved when you are young. And you will not just get saved, but you will get sanctified and wanting to serve the Lord. You won't waste your time doing a bunch of worldly stuff. You know? You're not going to waste your time saying, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Apparently they didn't agree with that point I just made or something. I don't know. You know. Huh. Getting back to what I was saying. Um, I think maybe I'll have a better spot here in the future to do videos. Crazy. But I uh, just wanted to do one here for a change. But thank you so much. The whole point is. When you are young. Sometimes that yoke that the Lord will put upon you when you get saved, it, it looks like it'd be a bad thing. But as you get older and you realize that uh, money doesn't satisfy and the things of this world don't satisfy, they don't make you happy, you know, when you start to figure that out, you'll realize that that yoke that the Lord puts upon you is actually a very wonderful thing. And it's where true joy is found. And I'm going to be doing my testimony at some point in time in the future. And... Uh, you know, part of my testimony is I spent many years acquiring various toys, uh, fast motorcycles, cars, ATVs, dirt bikes, whatever, a lot of things like that. Why? Trying to find happiness? Trying to find something that would get me through and, and give me joy? If I had only found the yoke of Lord Jesus Christ when I was a teenager and put it upon myself, I said, okay, uh, I'm laboring, I'm, I'm heavy burdened here, you know, Lord, please give me the yoke. If I'd have done that in my youth, instead of waiting till I was in my mid-twenties, to save myself a lot of heartache. Next, we're going to go to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to give you some, two more scriptures here before we close. These are for you today. You say, okay, Brian, I see the thing of, of, uh, that I should try and serve the Lord in my youth. 
you know, and I, I definitely see that there's a danger there in the thing of youth, of, of peer pressure and, and being concerned with what other people think of me and, and that are my age, you know, and, and taking counsel with younger people and not with the elderly. I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. Um, but how do I put some of this into practice? Well, fortunately, the Bible tells you. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The yoke upon you, in other words. But how does it come? Present your bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord. That's the first step. Okay, you get saved, and now you say, okay, Lord, you tell me what to do. I'm not going to make my own plans. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then you add the other things to me in your time, Lord. Present your body a living sacrifice. And it's your reasonable service, too, by the way. It's not going above and beyond the call of duty or something like that. It's your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. You know, I think... I think uh, one of the most important things that you can do is be a non-conformist. If you are a non-conformist, you'll do pretty good. But when you care about the uh, styles and the fashion of the world, you know, and things, you know, like the Bible talks about, you care about the things of this world, the things of this life, you're going to have problems. You're conforming to the world. And if you conform to the world, you can't prove what is God's will for your life. Just as simple as that. What should you do? You should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? By washing of the water? By the Word? Right there. That's how you renew your mind. Keep the Scriptures in mind. Next, and finally, we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter four, verses twelve through sixteen it says here, "Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity." Did you know you can be an example to the believers as a youth? I've been challenged many times by teenagers. Oh, yeah. I've seen some very godly young people, some very godly youths, ones that were like uh, David, and they see some uncircumcised Philistine coming, some atheist or Catholic or whoever. I've seen youths charge right into battle with them. Just go right in, sword of the spirit in hand, and saying, this is what the Bible says. You know? And I've seen it come back on them too sometimes. They say, you're just a teenager. You're just a kid. Hey, let no man despise thy youth. Verse 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You know, if you want to be something, if you want to be used of God, I suggest you learn to read and learn to like reading. You know, get a bunch of books. You know, read the Bible. That's the most important thing. But I, I suggest reading books, too. Be a good reader. Verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, continuing in the things that you've learned, thou shalt both... Or for doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Very important. You see, you're supposed to learn the word of God. And you're supposed to do things for the Lord, for the sake of the Lord. 
And when you learn those things and you've been assured of those things, continue in them. And say, I'm not backing down. I'm going to continue to stand for the King James Bible. I'm going to continue to tell people how to be saved. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to be a worldly Christian that, uh, you know, goes around and messes with the world and ends up being a hypocrite. You know, a Christian that uh, one minute you're out handing out tracts and next you're seen in a store that sells pornography. Or uh, gets online and, and uh, is looking at things online and you get caught. Bad thing. Bad idea. Or you start to smoke cigarettes and somebody sees that. Or you get drunk. Just with some friends, you know. I mean, what was I supposed to do? I was at a friend's house. I didn't want to make them feel uncomfortable, you know. So I just took a drink. You better take heed to the counsels of an older man. An older man that reads from the Word of God. And if you see that these things are so in Scripture, you better take heed and continuing in, and continue in them so that you can save yourself a lot of grief. Don't fall for the thing of peer pressure. I can say that there were some things in my past that uh, I did that was really stupid, but yet there were some other times when I praised the Lord that even in my lost condition, I did not succumb to peer pressure. Um, I had the benefit of having a father that was a paramedic, and he would tell us stories of people that were uh, drunk with alcohol, people that were high on drugs, and kind of accidents that they get into and things, and, and he'd tell us really graphic details. And uh, because of that, I never had a temptation for alcohol. And I remember the night of my graduation from high school, um, I remember going and, and uh, there was a girl's house that, that she was having a party, and, and me and a couple of my buddies went and things, and there was a whole bunch of kids there and, and things, and, and uh, most of them were drunk. And they were trying to get me to drink, and I said, nope. So, well, we're going to do some, just go out and driving and stuff like this. I said, I'm not going anywhere with you drunks. I don't think so. I did a lot of things that were stupid in my youth, but that was one thing I did right. And I thank the Lord for that because I never ended up as one of those kids that uh, was in an accident, a drunk driving accident. I did that one thing right. So, uh, you know, I just... Watch out for peer pressure, brethren, you know, and, and sisters too. You know, I, I realize that there are some young ladies out there that they get peer pressured into doing things like dressing immodestly because, you know, the other girls are doing it and they get dates. You might not have ever been on a date yet or, or really have too many guys interested in you and things. Wait on the Lord for that. Uh, young women especially, you need to have a very high standard and just simply say, I'm not going to settle for anything less than God's best for me. And you might be older until that happens. God might put you through a lot of years until He brings that right man into your life. But you spend that time studying the Word of God and learning how to be a good keeper at home. Learning skills that you can use to help out your husband in the future. That's where you spend your time. And don't get caught up with uh, going to shopping malls and all the other electronic things that you can covet after and, and uh, all the all the stuff that gets you mixed up in the world. Don't mess with it. That's my advice to you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for showing me that verse earlier this week when I was just listening to your word and, and I just really brought to memory some things that I did in my past and the sins of my youth. And, uh, Lord, I can't really do anything about those sins right now. They're, they're, they're over. I can't go back and change the past. And I realize, Lord, that they're under the blood and, and you've forgiven me for them, but I just wish I could have had more fruitful time serving you. Um, and while I can't help myself, Lord, I can help those youth that are out there right now listening to this message, that um, the temptation to give in to their peers is so strong and Lord, I just pray that they would fight against that temptation, that they would take the counsel of older people and uh, learn to listen 
to them and gain insight from their wisdom, the things that they've gone through. And I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That will be it for this study. Uh, like I said, I just thought I'd do a sermon in this spot here today. Probably not going to do it again because highways that way and uh, it's kind of obnoxious. <laughs> I don't normally like to, to hear highway noises and things like that. So um, please keep us in your prayers. Uh, gonna, as far as this Jack Hiles study is concerned, I'll say this. If you've seen the little teaser, so to speak, the little intro to the thing, um, that will be the introduction to the video. And that's just, I just showed some of the more crazy stuff that I found. There's still some other things that I've found that are really nuts, and I haven't included that in that little eight minute video, eight and a half minute or so video. Um, the Lord showed me some really, really, really wild stuff about Jack Hiles and that whole system out there. And um, it's just, I've had this happen now a couple times. Sometimes, you know, I, I try to research a subject, I wonder about something, I have a question. And I start to research it and it just kind of goes to a dead end and just stops. And it's like, well, I pursue some different angles and I think, is there a tie into the Jesuits? Is there a tie into the Masonic Lodge? Is there a tie into this, a tie into that? And I don't find anything and I just kind of go, no, yeah, okay, you know, whatever. And uh, this Jack Hiles study, <laughs> not been the case. Um, it just this link goes to that person this this goes over to here that goes over to there and you know the videos that i a lot of the video that i was showing there in that introduction thing um it's videos that they put out themselves jack hiles in the first baptist church and uh the hiles anderson college it's their own stuff that they're putting out i'm getting it from their own youtube channel so it's not that i'm finding some secret thing that people put together to make them look bad they're the ones putting these videos out and I found even more controversial stuff that they themselves are putting out. So uh, just absolutely crazy. I'm going to try to get that study done. It's going to take a lot of work. Um, I've already watched many, many, many hours of uh, Jack Hiles preaching and, and videos about their school there and whatever else. And uh, read a lot of articles. And... Um, and I'll just say this too, uh, in case you're wondering. I actually started out the study when I started hearing some things about Jack Hiles. To be very honest, I started out to defend him. To be very honest. And uh, years and years ago, I actually preached in a Babel building where Jack Hiles once spoke. And I was so honored to be able to stand in the same pulpit uh, that Jack Hiles once stood in. I just, I remember that I was, I was just like, Wow, you know, Jack Hiles preached here? Jack Hiles was behind this very pulpit where I'm standing? <laughs> and I was, I was honored by that. Now it's like, uh, <laughs> uh, things have changed a bit in my mind. And, you know, I, I really did go into the study thinking to myself, uh, he's being framed, you know, he's a good Bible-believing preacher. He's being framed, people trying to make him look bad. And I've just seen more and more evidence, and it's just like, he was a crook. He was a very bad man. So, um, no idea really when this thing's going to come out. Uh, I'm really going to work hard on it here. Uh, there's always some kind of little thing. Uh, just the other day, um, came back from, from doing some work and uh, getting out of my vehicle. And, and um, I hear this, pssst, and I'm thinking, what is that? Look at the back tire. It's going flat. So I didn't have a, normally I have plenty of the tire repair kit. I have a little plug thing that you do. I've done that quite a few times over the years, but I went and I checked and I didn't have any of the glue that you use. And I was, uh, so I had to take a day to go someplace to get the, the materials and things like that and then come back. Um, Cause I just have a, a small motorcycle that I can use when my truck's broken down because that's the only vehicle we have. We have a truck and that's it. And um, so now my starter, I think, is shot. Uh, just, you know, you turn the key and just just nothing at all. 
there's absolutely nothing there. Lights all work, everything electronic works, but doesn't turn over. So it's either a starter or some kind of, I don't even know what. Uh, I haven't really worked much on this truck. I've done work on older vehicles because they're easier to work on. But So there's all these little things that spring up and just are there to keep me away from the work. And, and you know, people don't see that and they think, you know, oh, you know, why does it take you so long, Brian? Well, there's one of me. My wife helps somewhat with research, but she's got housework to do and other things around the home, you know. And, uh, you know, there's just just me. I am the video production crew. The the uh, I write the script, <laughs> so to speak, uh, do the research, put the thing together. I mean, so please just bear with me. I, I do want to thank everybody out there, too, that's been mirroring my videos and putting them on other channels. Uh, that's... That's wonderful because that's how we're going to preserve uh, this ministry. And uh, so thank you to everybody that's been doing that. But um, I'm going to cut this short now and just thank everybody out there for praying. And um, just uh, please continue to pray as we uh, go into some, um, well, as I just try to get this study done. It's, it's been very, very difficult, very trying. So um, just stay tuned, and you'll see when the video comes out. I'm thinking probably another within the next week or two is when it's going to come out. And it's going to be a multi-part study. Let me tell you, <laughs> the things the Lord show, showed me and everything, it's going to be many parts to the video about Jack Hiles. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.